right, hey, good morning. This is uh, Jeffrey Hall from Richmond Vascular Center. We are going to do an ellipsis vascular access procedure. Uh, the patient is a 61-year-old female with end-stage renal disease 5. She's not on hemodialysis yet. Her EGFR is 11.4, and her nephrologist felt that having an access created was urgent as uh, dialysis is imminent. Uh, her past medical history is remarkable for hypertension. Uh, <clears throat> she's not diabetic. Her BMI is 25.5. We're going to create a right arm AVF, uh, likely with basilic vein outflow because the cephalic vein is small, and I'll show you some of these images. Our approach will be from the median basilic vein. So I'm going to switch you over to images. So I'm just going to show you the right arm. This is a fairly typical mapping that we perform. This is the cephalic vein in the upper arm. You can see it's only 1.8 millimeters in diameter, so fairly small. As we move down uh, to the middle arm, you can see not only is it small, but it's deep. It's um, only 2 millimeters in diameter, and it's 4.6 uh, millimeters deep. Then in the distal upper arm, 1.9, so still small, visible all the way down. Then the median cephalic vein is thickened. Looks like this has been used as an IV access site. The basilic vein is much better, uh, much better vein. It's 3.4 millimeters in diameter, but it's deep, and so it will require transposition. But this is the likely outflow for this patient. Then we have the Basilic vein a little higher up. I guess about two and a half millimeters, so a little bit of concern here, just all the way around. And then as we get more centrally, it gets big again. Here's the median basilic vein, good size, 2.9 millimeters in diameter. And then here's our image of the perforating vein. You can see that it's straight in this segment here as it comes and approaches the proximal radial artery. So this makes this a pretty good candidate. What you'll notice is that there's, you lose the image of the perforating vein here, and that's because it's uh, making a little bit of a bend as it goes up into the median basilic and median cephalic vein where those meet. So we're going to try and actually access this patient further up towards uh, up in the median basilic vein. And the reason is we want to have at least two centimeters from this dot to the... Um, uh, to the crossing point. And let me see if I can show you that. You can measure these uh, this ahead of time when you do it like, like I'm doing. So that's two and a half. So you can, you can see if you, if you enter the perforating vein where you can see it um, in continuity, you're, you're kind of short, <clears throat> short siding yourself with only uh, less than one and a half centimeters between your access site and the vein and your crossing point. So we, we like to have a little more distance than that. So uh, we'll um, get the patient ready. We're going to do a brachial plexus block, which um, we'll demonstrate uh, shortly. Thank you for your attention. All right. So OK, so here's the basilic vein. Um, let's mag up a little bit. Coming down, and then cephalic, and then there's our perforating vein. Yeah, I'll get it. Um, so you can see those are the veins around the radial artery, and there's going to be our crossing point right there. So then we follow the perforating vein up. And then it splits into the uh, basilic, which is over there, and the cephalic, which is over there. So they sort of splay. So let's go long on this. And you can see that's the perforating vein before it. And that's probably right about where it, where it bifurcates that you can see. Show the arrow to the left. OK. So that's the start of the perforating vein. And it comes down goes into the radial vein. It sits on right on top of the artery, which is right there. So 
question is. The perforator looks nice and straight and comes down right on top of the artery. Yeah, except for that, um, you know, you don't, you want to be careful not to stick, let's say you try to stick the top of the perforating vein. What you want to make sure is you don't stick halfway down the perforating vein. Yeah, because it's a lot of times, um, so I'm going to try and pick a spot a little bit higher and realizing that you're going to be coming from lateral to medial. But this right here, I think is our cephalic vein. No, it's our it's our basilic. Okay, so our, our cephalic is way over, comes way over here. So we're going to end up sticking the basilic vein and coming down there through here and down like that, and then make our crossing right there. So it's a good, you know, it's good practice to sort of spend a couple of minutes doing this, you know, getting ready to access it. I like sticking our, the non-intended vessel. Yeah, marker. I'll do marker. Right, right. You want to be able to make a straight line from your entrance to your crossing, and realizing that you're you're only going to be able to move the needle so much. So I'm going to start right there. All right, let me have lidocaine. You doing all right? Sleeping? Okay. Sticking a burn, maybe. So I don't make it a nick anymore because sometimes the vein is too close to the surface. And you end up nicking the your target vein. So one of the tricky bits is finding the needle tip when you first start. And you can get, it's real easy to get deep, see how deep that needle tip was. So it really needs to be up here more. And that looks a little more promising. So this switching back and forth between Transverse and long is very useful. I'm still not in the vein yet. There we go. I'm already at the pop. Okay. So now we're coming down the perf, so. And, you know, I think I talked about giving myself enough room, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. By the time you actually enter these veins, especially when they're close to the skin and they're pliable, you'll have come down a centimeter or two. So you want to give yourself enough room to make that happen. And so there's our needle there. It's probably too far down. So I like to look in two views here. You can see the needle tips a little past the artery, so I'm going to pull it back a little bit. Then I'm going to swing it over on top of the artery.
Yeah, so behind it a little bit. Okay. So we're in the artery, and I'm going to. A lot of people ask, do you need to have someone helping you do this? And I like it when we demonstrate because you guys can see more. So instead of me putting down the the transducer, I'm going to have Wendy hold it for me. And you can see there's our needle right in the artery, and there's the wire coming through. So we'll go ahead and put the sheath in. I love the way your ultrasound has a arrow that automatically highlights the uh, crossing point into the artery. The autom yeah. Well, that's uh, that Wendy's doing that as well. <laughs> yeah, a little AI here. She's really trying to sh she tries to show me where to go, really, <laughs> just in case I forget. So, of course, they're getting the catheter ready. So I'm going to flush it. I'll give a little little heparin. Um, once again, since we're demonstrating, we're going to take our time. Um, it's really kind of a homeopathic dose here, 3,000. So, I, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so she's showing you the, the there's the proximal radial artery, and you can see where the, um, and it's always medial to the um, perforating vein. So you can see the sheath in the perforating vein as she moves lateral, then you see the artery. So that's where we're going to, that's the little bit of artery we're going to capture. So we just want to make sure we've, clearly identified that site uh, because that's where we're going to close the device. And um, so I also have marked it on the skin um, so that, um, uh, and I think that's a good habit when you first start so that, you know, if you think, if all of a sudden your, your crossing point looks like it's somewhere way different, you can sort of say, hmm, I wonder if I'm in the right place. So here we have the, I'm going to bring the device in, so it's all in. So you can see that. And I'm going to back it up a little bit. Now I'm going to pull the sheath off. Then you can see the tips nicely in the artery. And I'm going to close it. And see how I have a good grip on it there. You can see all the tissue moving. All right, so what kind of gap do you have? 0 0.1. So she's going to now hit the activation button. Activate. All right. So these are short activation pulses. And we're going to let this run until it stops on its own. You see micro bubbles going up the artery and down the vein, or down the artery and up the vein. And I like to see that. That also is a good indication that you've, you're in the right place. All right, hang, hang on a second. We're going to, one second. All right, let's do the removal pulse. Okay, it's out. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's, let's answer that question. So the point one just tells you how much tissue you have um, between the jaws, it tells you. And so if you have too much, um, you know, maybe you haven't crossed in the right spot. And I've taken the tourniquet off, so and we're going to get a, um, a waveform here. And if you have too little, maybe you just closed the, the device on itself and didn't capture any anything. So here's uh, the waveform. Looks pretty good. Got pretty good diastolic component already um, of 60. 
peak, peak diastolic of over 60, smaller artery. So we always have to try and guess what this is going to be. How big was the artery? 4.2, so it's going to be 400. Okay, 357. Okay. Now we're going to balloon it. Okay, you can see the sheath there. I'm going to pull it back a little bit. And there we are. We're crossing easily. All right, and balloon up. Okay. It's so it's watermelon seeding out. No, leave it up. Let's see. We'll go down again. We'll go down a second. Let's see. So smaller artery, you're going to tend to get this watermelon seeding. Go back up again. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm holding a little pressure to keep it from sliding out. Yeah, not going to be able to. Okay. Okay. I will right, we'll just leave there for a minute. So that's mostly dilating the perforating vein. It slipped com almost completely out of the artery. When we show the proximal radial artery, and the swing over, you can see. Yeah, so it's hard to see with the, the balloon right there. We're sort of occluding it. Do you balloon dilate every patient? Always do. And now, partially because we were getting approval to add that to our IFU which we have now, um, and to show that it was safe, um, which we have. But also, you know, you tend not to get adequate flow. Now, sometimes I will, um, you know, one of the important things that's happening here is we're dilating the immediate perforating vein to five millimeters. So that will be required to get an adequate fistula in most cases. So then the, the next thing is, gee, did I really get the anastomosis open? So. If it keeps watermelon seeding out, I'll get a four millimeter balloon and make sure I really get that anastomosis uh, broken up. All right, let's uh, take that down. So let's see if I've lost access here. Oh, managed to keep. All right, then what we'll do is we'll um, get another flow. Yep, yeah. we'll get a flow here. And. See, see what see what the difference is. So, so a little a little bit better diastolic component here, and then um, 481. Yeah, let's see the uh, anastomosis. So there's the, let me pull the sheath back. Yeah. So even though, yeah. let me have a four millimeter balloon. Let's just, because it kept sliding out of the anastomosis, I'm not sure I got, yeah, that I got is the anastomosis as open as I would have liked. All the way to the left. Well, it looks pretty open. So go slow on that. So she has small arteries, small veins. So we, 480 may be all we'll get today. Um, I was hoping to see a little improvement after ballooning. How's the proximal radial artery? That sometimes goes into spasm. And is, so you can see a little thickening and spasm there. And that's, you know, with all this heat and pressure, that's not uncommon. Um, and that's probably what's limiting the flow a little bit. Overall, still pretty good, though. Um, what do you guys think, Brad? Think we're done? I think it looks great. You're probably limited by the uh, inflow. Yeah, I think we're done. All right, but those are things just things to think about. If I still wasn't happy with the flow, I might put a four millimeter balloon in there. Uh, generally, when I come back at four weeks, if I don't, if I'm trying to increase the flow. I will use a six millimeter balloon. I will no longer use seven and eight because they will give you flows in the 2000. So, um, um, so I'm, pu I'm pulling the sheath out, um, and we'll just hold light pressure here for 
five minutes. The procedure itself looked really straightforward. Um, when you when you bring them back for a follow up, and and what do you do at that follow up visit? Um, you know, is one week the proper time point to bring them back? Yeah, one week. Just here's what the one week visit just to make sure there are no complications, number one. Number two, to review with them, they often forget that, you know, at four weeks you're going to prepare them for dialysis, and it gives you another opportunity to say, okay, you know, we're going to, at, at four weeks we want your fistula to be used for dialysis, and it'll be the day after the next visit. It lets us um, be a little more um, precise about what we're actually going to do. So like in this patient where the cephalic vein looked really poor on the mapping, after the block today, that cephalic vein looked a lot better. And so, you know, the this cephalic vein may surprise us, even though it was only measuring two, um, and just a little over two up the arm. If it measures four at a week, we'll be, okay, let's, we're going to preserve this cephalic vein and we'll use that um, as our primary a target vein, and um, so it's um, it you know it's a good time to just check and and recalibrate what you want to do. Make sure the patient doesn't have any bleeding or pain or uh, neurologic problems. Doesn't have steel. Um, so you know there's there's all the things that you want to make sure they don't have, um, and then uh, and it's. It's usually a short visit and an ultrasound uh, follow-up. And then um, at four week, I always tell them, okay, this is what, we're, and at the one week visit, I explain to them, we're, at four weeks, we're gonna do this, this, and this to get you ready for dialysis. And um, so it, it's a good a good preparation. I think a lot of times if you don't have that visit, um, you know, there's, they don't really get it. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for sharing that case with us, Dr. Hall. And I also wanted to thank all the uh, people that took the time of their busy schedule to uh, join us on the case today. Appreciate it. As always, if you have any questions, reach out to any one of us at Avenue Medical. Uh, have a great day. Stay safe.